What's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlegag Martial Arts Radio. And today, Andrew and I have another rapid fire QA in store. I don't know what's coming. He's going to ask me some questions. Look at that smile. I'm worried. I'm not really worried, but maybe I should be. I want to thank you for watching. You can see us in person. If you are listening to this, you might want to stop and watch the video, unless you're driving or something where you. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. That would be bad. But of course, the video versions are available on YouTube. Now, if you want to see everything we've got going on, go to whistlekick.com. It's our online home. It's a place you're going to find all the things that we're doing, including our store. Store at whistlekick.com. One of the variety of ways that we offset the cost of the show and the other content that we produce. And if you use the code podcast15, you'll save 15% off some gear or a uniform. In fact, by the time this comes out, there's a good chance there's new gear in the store. There's, there's gear on the way again. Mm. It's taken a couple of years, literally, but it's happening. Uh, what else? Whistlekickprograms.com, place you can get various training programs that are not affiliated with any particular martial art. They're martial arts agnostic. And then we've also got our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whistlekick. We actually just recorded an exclusive episode for the Patreon talking about, how, you, how would we describe that episode? Just do it. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to steal Nike's slogan. It yeah, was it was kind of basically that it, uh, talking about being willing to do things that maybe you're not great at and, and where that can lead. So I thought it was a good conversation. I, I like talking about that subject. Check out the Patreon. You get free merch. We're throwing stickers and shirts and all kinds of great stuff at you now. So patreon.com slash whistlekick. And if you want to check out this show, whistlekickmarchmarchradio.com, newsletter, every episode we've ever done. Uh, we've got some collections of episodes, guest submission form, all kinds of things. Anything else we throw into the top of the show where we roll into this thing? No, I think you hit it all. <laughs> share, you know, share this with all your friends. You know? Yeah, you know, that that here we are six plus years in. That is still the number one way that this show grows is when people say, hey, did you see this thing that these people said? Whether it's these people or this person or this person and... Yeah. I was I was going to point at the mannequin over there, but a guest. <laughs> you can't see. There's a, a very large mannequin. It's far taller than either either of us. I'm intimidated because he's got really good abs. He has great abs. We're not going to talk about the rest. Okay. Of <laughs> All right. So these rapid fire Q and A's. People seem to like these. Yep. Yep. Are they getting better about sending you questions? Uh, no. You should send me oh. more questions. You know, it's funny because on the back end, people like they they seem to enjoy throwing me for a loop yeah and i have a couple of questions good, like that today good so how do you get a hold of you andrew at whistlekick martial arts radio.com yep just shoot me an email or you can find you on social media yeah, you're, you're available I'm on facebook all Don't, the time i mean theoretically you could send them to me but i'd rather you didn't because i like the surprise yeah especially when they're fun ones like one i have today mm. And you're going to have to, pardon me, I don't usually do this, but it is hot in here. It's not nearly as hot as outside, Yeah, sure. but I'm going to be drinking iced tea. All right. So are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Question number one okay. uh, was, you've discussed before the relationship that instructors and students should have with each other. And should not have. And should not have. Yeah, absolutely. But I would like you to describe the relationship an instructor should have with their students and how that relationship starts to change when the student starts taking more of a role in the school, when they start mm -hmm. teaching and start being on test examinations, exam boards and things like that. Like how mm -hmm. does that, if at all, how does that relationship change? I think you can look at it two ways. I think you can look at it, the relationship from the specific actions, in which case those definitely change. Or you can look at it from what are the principles, what are the attitudes, what are the responsibilities that lead to the actions? Because I don't think those do change. If we think about what is the responsibility of a, a young student, and I've been using those terms, younger and older student, not in terms of age, but in terms of length of time training, it, it seems like a better way to describe it. So if you think about a young student, what's their responsibility is to show up, to train, to practice, to appropriately ask questions, to hopefully support the school, whatever those conditions are. Now, if I've been training that school for 30 years, I don't think my responsibilities have changed. I don't think the way that I engage with that school or that instructor necessarily changes at that level, at a, at a mm -hmm. macro level. I'm still going to show up. I'm still going to support the school. Maybe that looks like training, uh, I'm sorry, teaching or taking over for classes when the head instructor goes away, something like that. But I'm still 
doing all of those things. Now, of course, the specifics can change dramatically. When I'm a younger student, I'm probably paying dues and confused and putting my foot in my mouth and embarrassing myself. When I'm an older student, I am potentially not paying or paying for private lessons or the majority of my time in the school involves me standing at the front of the room mm -hmm. and I'm teaching breakout sessions with the students. There, there are a lot of different ways that, that we can start to look at this. And so those are the specifics with the school. Now, what about the, the instructor? Because that, that was the heart of the yeah. question. What's the goal of the instructor? What is the role of the instructor? It's to facilitate the, the martial arts development of the students. And if I'm a young student, that path is pretty cut and dry. I show up, I train, I practice, I pay my dues, whatever. When I'm an older student, there can be some variation there. I've had instructors who didn't know what to do with me because I had been training so much longer than any of their other students. They're like, ah, go teach those people. Mm. And in those cases, the delta seemingly decreases between my instructor and, and myself. It, not quite peers, but if we think of, of peer versus superior subordinate, that, that gap seems to change. Now, that could just be in, in, my, in my perspective. It could just be my mindset. This is a good question. This is a really good this question. That's why I asked it. Yeah, I appreciate it. I think there's so much opportunity for variance at the, let's call it the, the further along the older a student is. And I, I'm thinking of other instructors that I work with, instructors I've worked with off and on for a very long time. And we know each other so well that there are times when it seems to flip back and forth between a peer relationship and a student teacher relationship. Mm -hmm. And we know where those lines are. We don't have to talk about them. We don't have to wonder. It's just, you get enough time in and it just happens, right? And it's, and, and I'm not talking about five, six years. I'm talking about literally decades. And I don't know for, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to train with any of your instructors for decades. I, I actually haven't. Yeah. Things really change in theirs. And, you know, I'm thinking of, of my original karate instructors who started teaching me when I was four years old. They helped raise me. If I make a list of the people who helped raise me, yeah. you know, both of them are in the top 10, you know, probably both in the top five. So they, they, they know me in a way, I know them in a way that, you know, it's, it's kind of like having a, a narrow relationship with a parent, you know, your parents are your parents and they parent you in every way. This is like, they're my karate parents, my martial arts parents. I don't think there's a one size fits all. Okay. I think I'll leave it there. All right, that's fair. But I, if, if other people have different perspectives on this, I definitely want to hear it because this is something I don't know that I've ever considered. Yeah. So I've always thought, uh, and you know, you have mentioned this in the past as well, that the, the relationship between the instructor and the student should be, be continue to be a professional relationship. Okay. And uh, I don't want it to sound like it's all business, but you know, you, the job of the instructors not necessarily do become best friends with the students in the class. And in a lot of ways that can be detrimental. Quite often it breaks down. Yeah. In fact, when I think of schools that have blown up, it's either because there was a romantic relationship mm -hmm. or a friendship relationship. Yeah, but the, that relationship can definitely start to change as the student becomes more involved with, I don't wanna say the running of the school, but helping you know, with testing sure. and helping with teaching. You know, I mean, sure. I'm thinking of it in my case right now, this is the first week that my martial arts instructor in my school has been on vacation. He took the mm. entire week off and he handed the school over to myself and another student and we are running the school for the week, which is not abnormal. I've taught classes in the sure. school many, many times, but it's usually been a day here or a day there and now it's boom, a week. Right. And so that's what made me think of this, uh, this topic. Interesting. It was a good question. I'd love to have a, even if it's just a, 
a personal chat after your instructor comes back? Mm. You know, just what, what did that feel like? You know, was there any kind of debrief and did that lead to any follow-up to this? And I'll make a note. Okay. Okay. Question number two. Uh, this was inspired by an episode that came out uh, a few months ago okay. uh, that Francis Corden yeah. was on. Cordon. Yeah, great episode. Yeah. And one of the quotes was, martial artists tend to be fairly nonviolent people. So the question is, are nonviolent people drawn to martial arts or do martial arts make nonviolent people? Mm. The first half of that are nonviolent people drawn to martial arts. I, I don't have a study. I don't have data points to back this up, but my gut tells me no, because unless you fully understand martial arts or, or even moderately understand martial arts, there is a tendency to see them as tools of violence. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm, I'm mildly confident in saying nonviolent people are not drawn to martial arts. Do we accept the statement, do I accept the statement that martial artists are generally nonviolent people? Yes. Why do some people get, become violent? Fear, ego. I mean, there, there are obvious answers, you know, self-defense, you know, let's put those aside because that happens so infrequently. If you are a violent person, it's probably not because people are trying to kill you all hours all of the, the day. Yeah, it's yeah. It, is, it is something in, in your personality. Can we then say that the inherent tendency towards being violent for some people is tempered through their martial arts training? And I would say yes, because as the average person grows as a martial artist, they become more confident they become less attached to their ego. And if those are the personality traits that lead to violence, I think it's logical that those, as they are tempered, lead to less violence. Thus mm -hmm. we can say, yes, martial arts reduces violent tendencies. Martial artists are less violent people. Okay, good, good answer. I feel very, very much the same. Damn, knocking yeah, these out. Yeah, that was great. Knocking these out. I, right. I, I can see the clock this time. I, if, you, if you see, if you, the, the camera's here, and actually for next time, we should put the, try to set the, the laptop up like right under the camera. Oh, yeah. So when I look at it, we're looking, looking yeah, at the yeah, camera. Yeah, that's a good idea. See, we're learning. Yeah. We're figuring this stuff out. All right. Next question. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll shoot you one that, uh, that should be pretty easy first, and we'll save the, the next one. We'll, okay. All right, got it. Ready? Yep. So. What is the thing you are most proud of in regards to whistlekicking? The platform that we've created. When I launched Whistlekick, I was under this false assumption that simply presenting martial artists with a better option in the beginning days, it was sparring gear. Hey, this gear is better. Oh, I like better, I'll buy better. I thought everyone would jump for joy. I thought I was not the only one frustrated at the caliber of sparring gear that was out there. I assumed I just had to bring in an order. It would be obvious. Everyone would buy it. It'd be fun. That didn't happen. When I set up at our first event, we made three sales. Two of them were to people who forgot their gear and did not care what they were buying. They just needed something. They just needed something. In fact, I remember one of them saying like, my division's now, I, I, don't, I don't have time to talk about this. Like I was so proud of what we had made. I'd invested so much. And then started looking around, okay, how do I get the word out? How do I get people to care? Uh, reached out to a prominent podcast at the time about sponsorship. I was putting ads in magazines. And all of this disjointed content that was supposedly a platform to reach the martial arts community was ineffective. It did not work. And I said, fine, we have to create our own platform. 
and you and I have talked about this, I've talked about this with other members of the team. I was incredibly frustrated and did not want this platform that we were building to ever be restricted to only our interests. Great example, um, when Christine Bannon Rodriguez and I were, were talking about her coming on the podcast, she said, you know, I'm, I'm sponsored by Macho. You have your own sparring gear. Is that going to be an issue? I'm like, no, not at all. Yeah, yeah. And unless it's been taken down, there is still a link from her show notes page to macho.com. To her gear, yep. Because I'm not going to pretend that alternatives don't exist. I want whatever we make to be the best, not the only. Mm -hmm. The timing of this, this question is interesting because just yesterday, issue one of the Marshall Journal print edition started to land in people's mailboxes. There is another piece of the platform. MarshallJournal.com, Marshall Journal, the magazine, this show, our Patreon, the blogs, the social media, all the content that we put out, I make available to people in this community. Anybody can write for Marshall Journal. I tell guests frequently when, when we're closing up their interview, if you have stuff you want us to push on social media, just send it to us. We'll put it in the queue. That is the thing that I think long-term will be the most helpful to the martial arts community is this platform to reach other martial artists. And thus, I think it has the opportunity to be the most transformational for the martial arts industry. And so that is what I am most proud of. Good. That was a good answer. I know that- I hope so. It's the truth. Well, wow, that's good. I, I know that you are not one to generally speak your own praises. And no, I don't like doing that. Yeah, I, I get that. But I think, uh, I think it's important sometimes to put that out there, to be able to say like, I did this and this was a good thing and you know. Drawspring shorts are awkward in, in, this, <laughs> in this setting because I'm sitting and I just realized like we've recorded a while and like the bow, if you're not watching this and you're listening, it's the drawstring bow on my shorts. It was just kind of In an awkward funny. position. It was, it was strange. I didn't notice. So. Well. All right, ready for the next one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like, <clears throat> I am secondly most proud of my ability to derail a serious conversation <laughs> with self-deprecating humor. I am when it because it gets uncomfortable for me. I don't. I don't like talking about myself. I don't like talking about the things I work hard on. Um, I like talking about the goals, the future, the progress, uh, the impact that we're trying to make. Uh, it's not about me. It's never been about me. I don't ever want it to be about me. Mm, I get it. All right. Next question. Yeah. What makes martial arts? art i've thought about this a lot I've, I've done episodes where we've unpacked this so when people say you know martial arts is just about fighting my response is always look at the term martial art one of those is a noun the other is the adjective mm -hmm. martial is not a noun it is an adjective art is the noun martial arts is art what is art my definition of art is that in which the creator leaves a piece of themselves to the, and, and you can kind of trail off with the rest of that to the betterment, enjoyment, whatever of, of others. And that definition for me comes from looking at um, specifically musicians that I, I, I think very highly of. Um, Bradley Nolan of Sublime, Kurt Cobain of Nirvana, uh, Amy Winehouse, these people who, flared up so quickly so brightly and just burnt out mm. and if you if you really want to see what someone is willing to do for the art go read Bradley Nolan's story go learn more about him he knew it was going to kill him mm. did it anyway because he had something he needed to create and leave the world with uh, what was the question again <laughs> what makes martial arts okay. art okay I wanted to make sure I was answering from the right angle. When we train, I don't care if we line up 500 people 
give them the exact same instructions from the exact same instructor at the exact same time. Like they're in a class at the same time. They're all going to do it differently. Now, there are times in demonstration and synchronized forms and things like that where we're trying to beat that out of our, ourselves, or we're trying to do it exactly the same. But think about any free form movement. If you and I spar, or you and I spar tomorrow, mm -hmm. or the day after that, it's going to be a little bit different. Yeah. Even if we do the same techniques, we're going to do them in different ways because we are showing up as that version of Andrew and Jeremy on that day. And the fact that it requires putting something of ourselves into it, it is not just... If, if, I, if I sit at a keyboard and I type a quote and I punch those keys, they have to come out in the same order. I can't mix up the order. The, it, the, if I type very fast or slow or there's a different cadence, it doesn't matter. That doesn't show up in the end product. I could read it that way. But if I do read it that way, if I speak it, if I say those same words, there's there's a difference in how I enunciate the pauses, mm -hmm. uh, inflection, uh, what's on my face when I say it. And there are martial arts schools that, that try to push that out of people. I think that that's the wrong thing. You know, one, one of my favorite things that I, I, I discovered in the last, it's only been in the last 10 years. When I think of forums at, at the highest level, it's the spaces between the moves. It's not the moves themselves. You can watch two very high level martial arts practitioners doing the same form in the same way. And you're going to end up with two different experiences. And it's not because of the movements. It's what they do between the movements. It's, there is another quarter beat between these two movements or the, the timing, the, the breath, you know, just these incredible subtleties. And to me, that's the greatest value of martial arts. That's why when I describe, you know, in, in karate, people typically describe it as the progression as kihon, basics, kata, forms, kumite, sparring, or free form movement. And I flip the last two. I think kata, I think forms is the greatest indication of someone's martial arts competency. Because I can show you, show me a great forms competitor who isn't at least mildly competent as a fighter. You mm -hmm. cannot say the same about the, about the opposite. Yeah, that's very true. Cool. All right. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, th I mean, I think the answer is different for everyone. I think the concept of defining art is such a difficult thing. If you were to sure. just a, a, approach anyone on the street, define art, that becomes a difficult thing to do. Um, you know, my instructor has often said his instructor would define art as structure without boundaries. If you think about that for a second, you know, mm. there, if you're an, if you're a painter, there's going to be a structure. There has to be something you're painting on. Right. That that thing could there's be whatever. There's a canvas. There's, there's no, a brush. There's, no there's specific there. colors be, that you've chosen. But but you could choose any of them. There's no right. you know if you're a painter, you need something to paint on, and you need paint. That's it. That's the structure. There's no boundaries after that. You could you could paint with whatever you want mm. to. You could paint on anything. You know, if you're a musician your instrument is your boundary. I mean, it's sure. your structure, right? Whatever it is, whether it's guitar or drum. Uh, and I think that's an interesting concept to think about, just think about what is art and what is the structure that you, as a, now we're talking martial artist, what's the, the structure? There's no boundaries, mm. but there's a structure. And the structure is we're punching and kicking. And how I'm punching and kicking may be different from yours, but that's where there's no boundaries. You do it any way you want to, you know? Right. Um, so there's good. Right. I like that. I, I hope people out there take some time and contemplate this question and how they would answer it for themselves. Mm. I think that's an important thing. The, the further you go in martial arts, I think the more your own understanding of this becomes relevant. Yeah. All right. Last question. All right. Let's do it. This uh, is a question from Jared Wilson, who is uh, the co-host of he and his, uh, the Paul Williams, uh, no, Dan Williams. Oh, I'm so bad. No, hang on. Jared, Jared, Jared is the host of Martial Thoughts. Sorry, Paul Wilson. Okay. Not Jared. Okay, Paul. that's an important distinction. Those are two different people. Yes, very. you're right. Of Karate Cafe? Yes, yeah. He's a, one of the co-hosts of Karate Cafe. Uh, and he sent this question to me specifically for our next Q&A. 
Nice. And his question is, what martial art is best for defeating a woodchuck? <laughs> I... <laughs> Did you, did you see my face start to get really really upset because i hate what marshall i hate. yeah i know, I know okay and i suspect that paul got, knows that as well and so when i got this question i was like oh this is brilliant. okay so this is great thank you um all right so we were talking about woodchucks earlier mm -hmm. and the fact that i have uh, trapped three of them had the opportunity to spend some time near them. They have really long toes with very sharp claws. Um, I had a pet rabbit. Mm -hmm. And early on, his first couple of years, he, he would get aggressive with me. We would fight. He would attack me, paw at me. And uh, what would happen next? I would kind of swat at him. Not really relevant. But I would imagine because woodchucks are diggers they would do this. This feels like a very weird how to fight episode that we're doing right <laughs> yeah, now. You're right. And I would imagine that because they have, they have long teeth, uh, they are rodents, I, I would assume their teeth would continue to grow, thus they are, are, are strong. Um, they're gonna bite if close and if slightly farther away, it's gonna be here. So not Brazilian jiu-jitsu, not any form of jiu-jitsu. I'm okay. not going to grapple with a woodchuck, no matter how large the woodchuck is. Okay. That doesn't feel like a good option. Uh, secondly, anything where I'm going to put my hands on the ground, so like capoeira, doesn't seem like mm -hmm. the best choice. I'm not going to plant my hands and come through with anything like that. That doesn't seem like a good idea, though the the side to side the lateral movement does seem like a good idea so I, I i could i could do that now really what i'm looking at is low kicks i'm not going to squat down to punch a woodchuck yeah that's fair i want to keep my face away i want to keep my face as far away my face is my most vulnerable part of my body to a woodchuck with those claws and those teeth yeah, and it's your money maker right i mean without without this i mean we wouldn't have any of this <laughs> You didn't, you didn't start time. That's right. We were good. I'll let you go for 10 minutes on this one if you want. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking about what martial arts are specifically engaged in low kicks. And the two coming to mind are two styles of karate. It's Kyokushin and it's Ishinru. Kyokushin, you know, those nice leg kicks. I could totally see if a woodchuck's there just hauling off and shin kicking a woodchuck in the head. Now, for anybody out there who um, is, is starting to get offended, maybe this is your first episode, which would be a strange episode to come in on, but that's yeah. okay. Um, I would never do that. Uh, I, I, I don't even eat cow. I don't eat beef, right? Like I'm, I'm, I love animals. So this is all purely hypothetical. And I also suspect that Paul Wilson knows that as well which is what makes this question right. even more in enjoyable. So uh, some low kicks out of Kyokushin or just Ish Ishinru where uh, the way I was taught, every all of your kicks are below the knee. Mm -hmm. You know, a good size woodchuck is, is going to be about, you know, this tall on all fours, but they like to stand up. They like to stand on their back legs and kind of survey things. And so, you know, uh, the bigger one that was in my yard was, was probably about this tall. And, uh, and not that it's, it's part of any fighting system I'm aware of, but they like cantaloupe. So oh. I would probably utilize that to my advantage. Like a distraction maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I took some video of, uh, of feeding one of them cantaloupe. Before you relocated it. I may or may not have relocated it uh, because of, of legal reasons. Gotcha. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I did. Fair enough. So low kicks, Ishinru, Kyokushin, keep your face away. Um, yeah. Awesome. Good question. Good question. That's a great Paul. question. I, I, <laughs> I like that fun stuff. I, you know, we take ourselves too seriously as martial artists. Sometimes. Well, and I like to save that one for the end. Yeah. Not for the last one. You know, the, yeah. other, the other questions were a little more serious. Um, and I apologize for messing up Paul Wilson's name. Jared Wilson was on my brain, I guess. When I wrote this Both thing. good people. 
Yeah, absolutely. Both great martial artists. Mm-hmm. Both po- martial arts podcasters. I know, right? Half of their name is the same. I, I mean, yeah. it's... Simple mistake. I, I met someone yesterday, and in the five minutes we were talking, in which I forgot their name entirely, uh, my name was reduced to Jason as I walked away. So, oh. you know, it happens. A name is a name. Yeah, yeah. I did find out there's another Andrew Adams martial artist, though. Really? Yes, he's a fifth degree black belt in Taekwondo out in the Midwest somewhere. I want you to interview him for the show. I could work on that. I think that would be fun. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. Anything else for this episode? That's it. All right. I want to thank you for watching or listening to this episode of Martial Arts Radio. If you're new, make sure you go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, sign up for the newsletter, check out all the other shows we've ever done. There's so many of them. This is going to be 600 and something. Uh, I'm not entirely sure yet. You know, you you probably already know. You know, and I don't. That's okay. If you want to support us and all the work that we're doing, you know, to buy things like banners, because you can see we spend so much money on these things. (laughs) Note the spray foam that is not even covered on this side. We covered it on that side. (laughs) I didn't notice. I got the good side. You got the good side. This is a really high budget operation we're running here. Uh, you got a few things you can do. You can go to whistlekick.com. And if you want, use the code podcast15 to grab something over there, shirt, sweatshirt, gear, uniform, whatever's over there. Uh, you can also support us through making a donation at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We received a donation over the weekend. Nice. Somebody, somebody threw us 50 bucks. I'm super pumped. Biggest donation we've ever received. Thank, oh, you. That's great. Thank you. I don't call out names. But, uh, two other things you can do whistlekickprograms.com check out what we've got over there and we've also got a patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash whistlekick we throw you some merch we throw you some exclusive bonus content you're not going to get anywhere else like a audio video episode we recorded earlier because it's all about value okay uh and if you want to leave us a review or tell people about what we've got going on it's another way you can help us out and it's if you've got questions for a future Q&A, email Andrew. Andrew, I almost gave him here. <laughs> I almost said my email address. Andrew at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. I'm Jeremy at whistlekick.com. And our social media is at whistlekick. Send me questions. Good ones. Only send good ones. And funny ones. That's okay. Or too. funny ones. Yeah. They have to be good and funny. Yeah, yeah. Well, if they're not good, I just want to use them. That's fair. All right. Until next time, train, train hard, hard, smile, and have, have a great, great day. day.